the cloud. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rockdown, for that beautiful introduction. Um, and all right, so I'm going to be sharing a bit about um, the idea of Plony Almoni. Um, so we see um, in uh, Root, um, in the fourth parak, it talks about this mysterious character who's named Plony Almoni, um, also named later in the piece about like a redeemer. Right, so we see in, in popular culture, in many, in many different forms of um, society, there's the idea of the anonymous, there's the Joe Schmo, there's the Tom, Dick, and Harry. Um, and so um, in Arabic, actually, the, the word is fluna, very similar to uh, the ploni that we see here. Um, and so here I'd like to evaluate why, um, why the word ploni, why the, these two words, ploni almoni, are randomly stuck into this text, um, and what the significance is on the broader community um, and what it means to identify as anonymous. Um, also, uh, Roche Kila, you could just tell me if I'm going over time, et cetera. Um, it might be, yeah. Um, so, um, so the first pasuk um, where we see Plony Almoni, um, it's really Boaz just trying to say, um, it, it says, Boaz Allah hashar vayeshev sham v'hinei ha-goel over asher di ber Boaz v'yamar sura shava po Plony Almoni v'yasar v'yeshev. So pretty much he, they're going towards the, um, the Yibum ceremony, um, where either the Goel, uh, the Redeemer, can claim Ruth to be um, his wife um, and Naomi's land to be his, or, um, or he can decline and that, then it would go to Boaz. Um, and so seemingly um, throughout this entire, um, entire process, he's referred to as a Goel. Um, he's referred to as just the Redeemer. Um, but here it sticks in the word Ploni Almoni. Um, where Boaz refers to him and says, so-and-so, come and sit over here. Um, and so Rashi's opinion on this, um, the reason why it says Plony Almoni, um, is to say that his name isn't written because he didn't want to redeem her. Um, he, it says later in the, in the text, lo uchal liol. It says, I'm not going to do it because I am unable to exercise it. Um, and it's because a possible that he's going to impair his nahala, whether that means some sort of inheritance of land, um, whether that's a somewhat ambiguous term, um, but Rashi pretty much says that there's no, um, he doesn't wish to do it. Uh, Root Rabbah adds to this that the possible reasoning for the name um, Almoni is because um, um, he was ignorant of the words of Torah um, because he didn't know the difference, he, he didn't know that uh, one was actually able to marry um, a Moabiyah. Um, and not, and actually is only not actually, is only not um, able to marry a Moabi. Um, so pretty much Chazal in these two um, instances set, tend to frame Plony Almoni in a pretty negative light. Um, he didn't do any of the mitzvot. Um, he was ignorant. Um, he, he decided not to redeem her as opposed to the, what the Pasuk says that he literally could not redeem her. Um, so I think it's worth looking at other places in the Torah uh, or in Tanakh where we see the words Plony Almoni show up um, to maybe give a, shed some light on the matter um, and because I, I think there's probably a deeper message going on here. Um, so the two other times that it's mentioned in Tanakh um, are both in times of battle referring to a place. Um, so it's referred to in Shmuel Aleph when David is talking to Avimelech saying um, that I'm directing my men to such and such a place, to El Makom Ploni Almoni. Um, sorry about that. Um, pretty much saying, okay, like, I don't want anybody to know where I'm going, so I'm going to say it in this sum in um, ambiguous term. Um, Malachim, it's pretty much the same thing, but um, this time with Melech Aram fighting against Ben Israel, also using the words Ploni Almoni. Um, and so it seems here, according to these, to these um, cases in David and Shoftim, um, that they elected themselves not to show the place in order to hide the identity during battle. It was their active um, statement of the term Ploni Almoni. It wasn't necessarily that the text decided to use the word Ploni Almoni to describe the place. It was the people in, themselves who decided to name themselves Ploni Almoni, um, which really differs a lot from what Rashi and um, Rashi and Rabba seem to say. They seem to say that the text is punishing him um, for, and it's a Mida Kanegan Mida type of moment. He, the reason why his name is Ploni Almoni is because he did not um, he didn't redeem, he's ignorant, and therefore his name isn't mentioned. Um, but here it seems to, I, I like to argue that um, according to the other times which it's mentioned, um, b albeit that they are describing places and not people, um, that um, he actually, the person himself, Plony Almoni the Goel, decided himself to take on the name Plony Almoni. Um, 
and right like there's other places in Tanakh where you don't see like where you see people described other jobs like there's um people described as concubines people not even described having names like eight bat paro eshet noach etc um so the dafka the fact that he adds the words plony amoni and adds on to the role of the redeemer is something that i think um is very interesting um additionally um in in rashi rashi actually commentates on um, Shmuel Aleph, the source in Shmuel Aleph, he says that the reason why um, the word uh, plony is mentioned is because of, sorry, I'm just turning on my do not disturb, um, whatever, um, is because of the word ki fle um, from uh, Devarim. Um, it says like, it, it says in Devarim, um, it comes from the same root of ki fle, um, which either means to be concealed in Rashi's case or yis kase, um, but also in that context, it could just mean too baffling or too wondrous. Um, and so that really confused me. I was like, why on earth is it talking about being wondrous or being too baffling in a case of being hiding something? Those seem to be um, pretty contradictory ideas. Um, so then I uh, decided to look at what the, where, like how, how on earth are Boaz and Plony Almoni related to each other? Um, and what, what's that relationship right, like? So Rashi um, also, it's a very Rashi heavy um, talk. So Rashi um, on Roots, Perak, Bet, Pasuk, Aleph, pretty much traces the lineage. He says um, that Plony Almoni is the uncle of Boaz and the son of Nachshon ben Aminadab. Um, and so maybe looking into Nachshon give, maybe gives us a better idea of who Plony Almoni was. Um, so we know that Nachshon um, led, led, um, led the, like, the Tzava of, um, of Judah, of Yehuda through the Negev. Um, and he was the, pretty much the commander of the troops and they were the first people to go in line in, in battle in the Negev when they were uh, traveling to um, Eretz Yisrael. Um, additionally, we know um, from many uh, Midrashim amongst the Mechilta um, that he, that Nachshim ben Aminadab was the person who um, jumped into the water um, and really allowed for, um, it was the first person to take the step um, and um, jump into the water during Kriyat Yamsuf. Um, to allow B'nai Israel to actually be able to cross um, on dry land. Um, so I think that all these ideas really play um, a very interesting, uh, are very interesting when you look at them next to each other. See, um, the idea of Plony Almoni, the idea of a wondrous act, a pella, uh, the idea of Plony, um, I think is very similar to um, what Nachshon and I guess also what Boaz did. Uh, the name Boaz, Boaz, um, so like inside of him there is strength. Um, in, uh, he also um, seems to uh, do a daring act to help another in need. He allows Root um, to, he, he gives Root exclusive permission to his field, um, allows her um, to, and pretty much gives her whatever um, she wants in order to survive. Um, a pretty wondrous act, in my opinion, or some sort of Pella. Um, and so that's similar to the name Plony. I think that what Plony Almoni teaches us is that there are members of any community who are not inherently wondrous and do not go above and beyond what is expected of them. And sometimes people might want to hide that side of themselves. Um, the idea of actively naming yourself anonymous shows to some sort of humbleness in the human being. Um, he could have chosen to remain nameless and go by the word Goel, but he understood that there is something to be said to be actively claiming yourself as not too wondrous or miraculous. Um, maybe if we all understand ourselves as not being the center of attention or being the miracle workers in society, um, this Shavuot can be a time of reflection. Um, we exist in a time where the Jewish people are somewhat constrained in their abilities to help out the community. And they are literally low chal. We are not able to help in many instances. Um, recognizing our inabilities may just be as powerful in creating a productive environment to help everyone and contribute positively and progress. Um, yeah, so that was my words. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, Yashakoach. Thank you so much, Davi. Yashakoach. Really, really beautiful. Thank you. Give us a lot to think about. Wow, lovely. Thank you. Um, if you care to share your words with, with me and I can send it out to people so that they can read it. Thank you so I'll, much. I'll send you the, the, the source sheet. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Awesome. I actually forgot. So this okay. is really I nice. know you do. And thank you for sharing. Your words. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We are now going to turn to um, an incredible student from Yavna Academy. Um, she hails from Muncie, but she often visits the Kahila. Her name is Dida Nyman. Um, I do have a relation with her because she's my niece. Um, and, but she has often given amazing words of Torah. And she's going to share with us some words, I think on Megillat Root, I'm not sure. Um, but thank you very much. You are spotlighted and you are ready to go. Okay. Um. 
I want to talk, yeah, I want to talk about Magia Root. Um, um, so, Root, um, um, one of the reasons why I think Magia Root is important because it shows up the act of caring and kindness. Because um, Abu Mala, um, there was a famine coming up um, and he didn't really care about everyone else. Um, and he was the king, so people depended on him and needed him, needed him, yeah, to help them. But he only helped his family. Don't get me wrong, it's like really, really good to help your family and you should all do that. But if you're the king or if you're a leader or if you're in charge of something and people look up to you, and because you are the leader of those people, you have to commit to that job. And committing to that job means helping them too, not just your family members. And Ruth, um, Naomi needed help too. Um, and she told, just go and help your family, help yourself. And instead of just caring for himself, for some reason they're married and just, Instead of caring for herself, um, she said, no, I'm staying with you. It wasn't out of disrespect and not listening. It was out of caring and kindness because she wanted to help her family, and she did her part of helping the family. But now for her, it was time to help other people. And that's why I think it's really important of maybe that real to help other, um, of one of the reasons why it's really important because it shows you an act of caring and kindness. That's it. Dida Yashikawa, you're getting a lot of, you know, silent applause um, because people are on mute, but that's really outstanding. Thank you so much, Dida, for sharing your beautiful words of Torah. Chag Sameach. I'm now going to ask, I don't know, I saw the Stern family somewhere. Uh, uh, Leah, there you are. I'm going to spotlight Leah Stern. Leah Stern, and except, uh, it's, it's so amazing. We have people of all ages. We have adults. We have high schoolers. We have college. We, we have so many different. And we now have an incredible middle schooler in seventh grade at SAR Academy who is going to share with us her words of Torah, this is Leah Stern, also an incredible Megillah Kohelet reader. Anyone who ever needs someone to link Kohelet for her, you should just know, she's extraordinary. So without further ado, Leah. What a special occasion we do in the week. In the week, we eat matzah. The sukkot are sitting in the sukkah. What do we do in the week? If we think and try to understand what we are doing, בשבועות, אולי נבין מדוע אין שום מצווה מיוחדת בשבועות. בפסח אנחנו חוגגים שיצאנו ממצרים, אנחנו אוכלים מצות כדי לזכור. בסוכות אנחנו חוגגים שהשם השיב אותנו בסוכות, וכמובן אנחנו יושבים בסוכה זכר לזה. אבל בשבועות אנחנו חוגגים את מתנת התורה. אבל איך חוגגים את נתינת התורה? התשובה הפשוטה. בשבועות אנחנו חוגגים להיות אנחנו, להיות עצמנו, על יד קבלת התורה. התורה מצווה אותנו, מספר, מספר רב של מצווה, עשה ולא תעשה, ש, שמדריכות אותנו איך צריכים לנהוג ביום יום. מהרגע שהם קמים עד שהולכים לישון, מה מותר לאכול, מה מותר ללבוש, וכאן הלאה. בשבועות אנחנו ש... שופטים מכל מלאכה ועוצרים, כמו שהחג נקרא גם עצרת, אבל לא עושים איזו פעולה מיוחדת, כי הרי כל מה שאנחנו עושים, אנחנו עושים על פי התורה. התורה מגלה את הטובה, הטוב של עם ישראל. היא מורה לנו איך להיות יהודים, איך צריכים לראות ימי יהודים עם עריכים. אר... התורה של ישראל היא תורה חיים, שמלמדת אותנו איך לחיות, לאורה, להיות יהודים אמיתיים. ולכן, שבועות, לאורה, להיות, לעשות הוא ללמוד תורה. 
ביותר, התלמוד. לילה טוב וחג שמח. חג שמח, תודה רבה, תודה רבה, וגם כן תודה רבה שאת דיברת איתנו בעברית, כדי שכולנו יכולים להבין את זה, ואני אסביר להם um, אחרי קצת זמן, מי שלא הבין, אבל תודה רבה לך. וואו, וואו, איזה זכות לנו. וואו, יש לקייח טיל. I now turn to Judy Federbush. Um, Judy is, uh, thank you, Leah, you're amazing, Leah, I love you. Um, I, um, I'll now turn to Judy. Uh, Judy, I don't see your face. Um, I, can, I can share the screen of what you, Judy has a, has a source sheet for us to look at. Judy, are you there? Yeah, I'm just trying to get the picture and the muting done at the same time. Okay, how about I'll mute you. Okay, I'm good. You're perfect, yeah, I got you here. Um, so Judy has been on the Kahila board for many, many years and given so much of her time and, and thought. And every Shavuos, she gives us an incredible um, shear to think about. And on, I, I couldn't have Shavuos go without having some <laughs> words of wisdom from Judy. So please um, give your attention. It's not going to disappoint. Um, Judy, I will share my screen for you. Uh, okay. so, yeah. so we can do that together, if that's okay. If, if okay, that's sure. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, so today um, we're talking about Shavuot, the holiday of Matan Torah, which is when we receive the Torah uh, Har Sinai. And uh, this mini shear is going to be about two laws that were revealed in a unique way, not from Sinai, but from two special groups of people, both of whom appear in the book of Numbers. These people each had a situation that even Moshe did not know how to handle. He had to ask God directly. And the answer that God provides in each case expanded beyond the specific circumstances of these groups of people and expanded to create a whole new statute, a new law, a new part of the Torah for everybody. So who were these people and what can we learn from them? These people are the Pesach Sheni claimants who are anonymous. We'll talk a little bit about who they might be and the daughters of Tzalachad. And um, there are a lot of common elements to both of these stories. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that link them together. And then we'll, we'll look inside and look at what the stories actually say. But these are a couple of words to, to look out for. One is how did they approach Moshe and the Kohen at that time, whether it was Aaron, the Kohen Gadol, or Elazar, uh, the way that they approached to bring their case before people, the word karov was used, either by uh, Kravu, Vatikravna Benot Slavchad Ben Chefer, in the case of Benot Slavchad, and if you scroll down to, um, to the story of Pesach Sheni, it, it says Vayikravu. They, they approached, they came near. In other words, it was out of closeness. They wanted to come close to Moshe and the Kohen. The other word that appears in both stories is the word nigra or igra, which means to be diminished, to be uh, limited in some way. Both the Benot Slavchad and the Pesach Sheni claimants say that the part of their problem is that they can't participate like everybody else. And for Benot Slavchad, they say, Lama Yigra Shem Avotenu, why should our father's name be uh, diminished uh, or limited? And for the Pesach Sheni claimants, they say, you know, we were. Uh, uh, ritually impure due to uh, having to deal with the death. So we can't celebrate Pesach when everyone else celebrates it. And they say, Lama Nigra, Levilti Hakrev et Korban Hashem Bamoado. Okay, so that's the second word. And then the third word that kind of connects both of these stories is what is their goal? And their goal is expressed with the word mitoch, within. Mitoch B'nai Yisrael. Um, in the case of Benot Slavchad, it says, um, give us um, uh, a piece of land within um, the brothers of our father. And for the Pesach Sheni people, it says uh, that their goal is also betoch b'nei Israel, that they want to celebrate the holiday uh, within the people. So 
Um, those are some of the common elements. And both of these stories are viewed as very positive by Chazal. It's a Chazal attribute the new law that we learned both in Pesach Sheni and from Benot Slavchad, that this was a benefit that was re revealed by meritorious people um, and that their claim was just. And it's interesting because if you look at the rest of Sefer by Midbar, it's a lot of complaining and a lot of uh, unjust claims and power struggles and all this kind of stuff, the sin of the spies, Korach, all these things are going on. And these are kind of the two shining lights, the people who had a legitimate claim and went for the right reasons. Uh, so now we'll just read through the story inside a little bit so you get a sense of what the claims are about. And then we'll talk about uh, another commonality, which is what it, what was it that they were missing out on? What kind of links these two claims? So the um, I'll do Benot Slavchad first, even though it happens second in the text, just because it's on the source sheet first. It says, "Vatikrabna Benot Slavchad Ben Chefer Ben Gilad Ben Machir Ben Minasha LeMishpachot Minasha Ben Yosef VeElishmon Benotav Machla Noach VeChagla Umilka VeTirza." So the daughters of Slavchad who are from a clan of Menashe, and it also mentions that Menashe was a son of Yosef, even though we knew that already. And uh, they stood before Moshe and Elazar Kohen, and they said, Avinu meit bamidbar, v'hu lo haya betoch haida hanoadim al Hashem beidat korach, ki becheto meit uvanim lo hayulo. That our father died in the desert, and he wasn't part of Korach's uh, eda, his faction. And he says, and, because, you know, because our father didn't have any sons, now he's not, his name is not going to be established within B'nai Yisrael. Lama yigrashim avotenu mitoch mishpachto ki ein lo ben, t'na lanu achuza betoch achiyavinu. So that's the essence of the claim, that um, the daughters of Tzlavchad want to have a share in Eretz Yisrael. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that um, these are kind of like the founding fathers of Eretz Israel. Like all of the uh, tribes, the regions were named after the tribe. Let's say the region of Menashe would be called Shevet Menashe. But even within that, the families of Menashe, that would be like the little towns nearby. So to not have their father's name there, it's kind of like he's not one of the founding fathers of uh, Eretz Israel. So that's, that, that's one of the things that made this claim unique. Now we're going to go to the Pesach Sheni claim. That's a, a similar claim, but about a different uh, object. Instead of saying, you know, we're not going to be part of Eretz Israel, here in Pesach Sheni, the people are uh, complaining that they won't be part of Am Yisrael, that pe the Korban Pesach is such a unique uh, way of expressing their membership in Am Yisrael, and to be denied the ability to give the Korban Pesach would really be uh, limiting or damaging in some way. And here, uh, just to summarize, it was in the, the second year in, in the desert, I mean, Bar Sinai, and it you know, came the time for Pesach, the first month, Chodesh HaRishon, and God says, you know, go make Pesach uh, at its time on the, on the uh, 14th day of Nisan. And Moshe told everybody that that's what they had to do, and that's what everybody did. And then, Vayhi Anashim Asher Hayut Meim La Nefesh Adam, Velo Yachlula Sota Pesach Biomahu. Okay, so here you have the anonymous claimants. They said um, they were Tame and they couldn't make Pesach on that day. And they approached Moshe and said, Anut Meim La Nefesh Adam, Lama Negra Levilti Hakrevet Hakorban. Why should we be uh, diminished in that way by not? Uh, being able to present the Korban Pesach. And then, you know, goes on and God says, yes, you can, you can make the Korban Pesach on the 15th of the second month, which is ER. And not only that, it's going to be a statute for everybody in the future, whether you're Tame or even if you're just on the road, if you're far away, you'll be able to, to make the, the Korban Pesach then. So what, what these two cases have in common is that the thing that they're missing out on is basically a basic citizenship right in the Jewish people. The right to a nachala, to land in Eretz Israel, that's what the Benot Slavchad are asking for. And the Pesach Sheni people are asking to be part of the Korban Pesach. And it's a unique Korban because it's incumbent on individuals together all at the same time. 
And it's not done by the Kohen as a representative. So for example, like on Yom Kippur, it's a very important korban, a very important service. The Kohen Gadol acts as our representative and uh, takes care of all the service for us. But on Pesach, every individual uh, person has to go and bring their own korban Pesach. So it's a kind of national korban and individual. It, it's both of those things at the same time. It's not like another kind of individual korban, like a korban toda, where you give thanks on your schedule for personal reasons when you have a, a need to do that. It's everybody has to be there at exactly the same time. And um, the other things that are similar about korban Pesach, like Brit Mila, the punishment is karet for failure to participate. So it's really kind of a citizenship uh, expression of being part of the Jewish people. Like if you're not doing Korban Pesach and Brit Milah, it's kind of like you're not part uh, of the Jewish people. And Korban Pesach is also linked to Eretz Yisrael in that during the time of Joshua, those were the two things that had to happen before the people could enter the land, uh, a Korban Pesach and a Brit Milah. Um, so these things were really core to participating uh, in the Jewish people. And the other thing that's interesting about Pesach Sheni is it's really for an individual who can't be with his community. Like if the whole community is Tameh, then either you delay Pesach by a month, you make an Adar Bet, or everybody celebrates Pesach together in the state of uh, impurity because you know, you're with your community, that's just the way it is. But Pesach Sheni is really for an individual who can't be with his community, and that's why they have to celebrate a month later. So it really illustrates uh, the want to be connected both to people and the connection to land of um, the Benot Slavchad. So now I'm going to come to uh, the second uh, portion of this year, and that is uh, who were these people? Who were the Pesach Sheni claimants? They're anonymous in the text. And, and how do they link to uh, Benot Slavchad? And what does that tell us about valid claims versus invalid claims? And the two people who are kind of linked through both of these stories are Yosef on the positive side and Korach on the negative side. You see in the Benot Slavchad, they're mentioned as being the granddaughters of um, Menashe ben Yosef, that Yosef is one of the key people in their claim. And they distinguish themselves as saying, we're not part of the Korach rebellion. We're like Joseph, we're not like Korach. And it's interesting that the Midrash fills in the anonymous Pesach Sheni claimants and says, who were these Pesach Sheni claimants? And there are a couple of suggestions. So one suggestion is they were the people who were carrying the bones of Yosef, and that's why they were Tamei. The, the uh, second answer is, no, they were uh, Michel and Elit Safan, who were taking care of the funeral for Nadav and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, who had recently died. And the third answer is that, no, they were just anonymous people dealing with an anonymous mate mitzvah that doesn't really matter who they were. But I'm going to focus on these first two ideas, the connection to Yosef and the connection to a Korach-like character. Because um, when people ask for things in the law, when the law does not fully accommodate their needs, as we saw in Pesach Sheni and in the daughters of Tzlavchad, there are different attitudes that people could take. And one attitude, the attitude of Korach is kind of Vayikach Korach. He wanted things because he wanted them. Um, the Midrash says that Korach was, um, did it mostly out of jealousy, that he was jealous that Elit Safan was going to be the Nasi for his tribe. And then everything else was window dressing. He said, you know, oh, I believe in equality and, you know, how come Moshe and Aaron get to do everything? But really what he was after was just political power. That was the, the basic idea. Whereas Yosef uh, in, in the Midrash is portrayed as someone who, despite all the factions and all the problems that he suffered with his brothers, both the ways that he antagonized them and the way that they sold him into slavery, he wants to make amends and he wants to reconnect with his brothers. And there's a beautiful uh, midrash, um, it's Shmot Rabbah, which is uh, on this, towards the bottom here, where it says, why, um, why was Pesach Sheni given as a holiday? It says, because of the bones of Yosef, because after his father Jacob died, he, told, he spoke kindly to his brothers. And he said, don't worry, I'll support you. I don't have any ill will towards you. Um, and 
that idea of trying to reconnect with his brothers out of love rather than out of jealousy is kind of the basis uh, for Yosef in the story. And it's the basis for how we connect to Yosef in the Benot Slavchad claim, in the Pesach Sheni claim, and we contrast that with the more Korach-like tendencies of um, just wanting things for political power or for selfish reasons. So hopefully uh, we can take some of what we learned from these claimants and be able to be Zoche to bring uh, new Torah into the world uh, because this is a time of Matan Torah. And I'll just conclude with um, the book of Ruth uh, kind of brings this to light in a lot of ways because Ruth pledge, you know, she pledges to join Naomi while she's on the road and says, you know, your people are my people. Where you go, I'll go. And in the end of the book, uh, through her marriage with Boaz, she both redeems the land and the name of Elimelech's El family. So those are the two themes, the people theme of Pesach Sheni and the land theme of uh, Benot Slavchad. And uh, she helps reestablish the lost name, just like the uh, daughters of Slavchad do. Um, so Chag Sameach, everybody. Thank you. Judy. That was fantastic. And thank you for this Makaros. I will share those as well um, with the group. Um, thank you for that beautiful Torah. Um, you never disappoint every year. Um, a lot to think about now. Um, thank you for all that connection. Um, we will now turn to, we, we, you know, this is a slam. So I go from one to the next. That's <laughs> how so it works, guys. Your concentration has been fantastic. I am now going to introduce um, I used to be known as Detroit, and now my Tabun Mufak, Judah Lo Patton, is known as <laughs> Detroit. Um, one of the greats, one of the greats, the way he thinks and asks questions, um, and is Oseik Batora, um, and he does so with such anivut, with such humility, and with such respect, deep respect for everyone and their ideas. So without further ado, he now attends Akiva. He's in ninth grade. Um, and he'll be finishing Smicha probably around next year or something like that. I think that's probably where he's at. Um, so, um, Mr. Yehuda Lopatin, please share some words of Torah with us. Uh, thank you, Roshka and Ivan. Uh, I was honored to be a uh, Roshka and Ivan student for, uh, two, for sixth and seventh grade. Uh, not long enough. And uh, it will really get into my Torah, but one thing that I, that I remember about learning in Roshka and Ivan's class was we used to, whenever we used to learn a new Mishnah, we would like ask, like uh, we would go over each of the words and we'd write like a little question mark over each of the words that we didn't, like, like that we had a question about that specific word. And that, that, that'll get into the rest of my Dar Torah. So, um, <clears throat> so I love thinking about the uh, intric intricacies of the words of the Torah and how every letter can teach us infinite lessons. Rabbi Akiva was able to learn heaps and heaps of halachot from every crown that was, uh, that was atop of the letters. The farshim, such as Rashi, often deal in these types of questions on the Torah. Why does it say, ish, ish, kitish, teishto, a man, a man whose wife turns astray, and not just a man whose wife? Why does it repeat, a man, a man? Every word is important, so what can this teach us? These are obvious extra words, though that seem out of place. Sometimes, however, I get to thinking about why does the Torah say et here, like the word et here. It's not that it's out of place per se, but just what can we learn from it? Is there something to learn from the fact that it says the word et here, or is that just some sort of grammatic, is that just some sort of grammatic convention? Uh, is there even something to learn at all? Uh, very few Mepharshim deal with these types of super specific questions, so when I do find one, I am super excited. NCSY is having a seam on the Chumash, and Detroit is doing Sefer Shmot. I took on learning Parshat Vayakel, which is not the most interesting of Parshiot, being primarily about the building of the Mishkan and its vessels. It's not that interesting at face value, but a certain Or HaChaim greatly increased my interest level in the Parsha. He actually did point out something which is not out of place per se. What can we list different things? Mm -hmm. 
vav, meaning and. And sometimes it will just be a comma, so to speak. Uh, he explains that when two items in a list are separated by a vav or an and, this indicates that they are on the same level, whether it be holiness or something else while not being separated by a, a, a above or an and, indicates that they are not on the same level. He continues to point out all the times that this rule applies throughout the rest of the parasha. For example, between the different parts of the Aaron Kodesh. Some parts are separated by above, but others are not, indicating that they are on different levels of Kedusha. This has, been, this has such an effect on the way that we understand the generous of heart that donated to the building of the Mishkan. Between all between all of them, between all the different ways that the generous of heart donated to the Mishkan, there is a vav. Uh, between uh, zahav, gold, and kesef, silver, and nechoshet, bronze, three different materials of clearly different monetary value are all separated by a vav and, are, and thus are all considered totally equal in the eyes of God. Whatever one can donate, it is equal to that of anybody else. The rich giving their share is no more valuable to Hashem than a poor man's share, even if the rich man is really giving much more money. There is a vav between Nashim and Anashim. They are also all totally 100% equal in the eyes of Hashem. Finally, and perhaps the most striking comparison, is between uh, the builders of the Mishkan, the actual builders, Betzalel, Aholiav, and the Chachmei Lev, the uh, wise of heart. Between each of them is also a vav. It says, uh, Even though it is B'tzalel that really, and, and, and Aholiav that really built the Mishkan. They, they were the ones that were leading the project. We credit them with being the ones that, 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 that really did it. Everyone that even participated a little bit in the building of the Mishkan is considered completely equal to B'tzalel, as if they themselves built the Mishkan. We must all remember that as long as we are doing all that we can, there is no reason to be jealous of anyone else's uh, dedica- uh, donation or dedication to Hashem, because Hashem loves us for who we are, just as we are. Yeah. That was beautiful. What an important lesson on, uh, you know, and as we all receive the Torah. In, a, in our own way, and we all have our contributions to make, and everyone's contribution is something that should be seen as equally valuable. Um, so thank you so much for contributing. Even though you're far away, you've been joining in these Zooms, so it, it, it's hard, but it's like one of my silver linings that I get to see you a lot here. So that's really fantastic, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. We now turn Boom, to our next slam, <laughs> to, to Ori, Ori Stern. Ori Stern, we have to wish you happy birthday because your brat mitzvah a few years ago was on Shavuot, um, where you lane Megillat root, and you did so, so beautifully, um, really um, with an incredible voice. Um, and your Torah also is so genuine and um, means such a great deal to me, and I know it will be to everyone who listens to you right now. So. Um, Ori Stern, who is a 10th grader at SAR High School um, and has been Zooming like crazy with her classes, but took time to teach us tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rosh Kilat Hyman, and also Rosh Kilat Hyman taught me how to read the Megillah, and I would not be able to do any of this without her, so thank you. Um, I'm going to speak in Hebrew, so if anyone needs me to like slow down or translate, just let me know. Um, אז אני הולכת לדבר על עשרת הדיברות, וכמו שאנחנו כבר יודעים, עשרת הדיברות, אנחנו כבר למדנו מחז"ל, עשרת הדיברות מחולקות לשתי צדדים, צד ימין וצד שמאל. החמשת, חמשת המצוות הראשונות הן מדברות על בין אדם, בין אדם למקום, וחמשת המצוות, חמשת... המצוות האחרונות הן בין אדם לחברו. אז אנחנו כבר שמענו את זה מחז"ל, ועכשיו אני הולכת קצת לדבר על... סליחה, עכשיו אני הולכת לדבר קצת לפי הכלי יקר, מה הוא אומר, ואיך שבאמת עשרת הדיברות מחוברות אחד לשני, ושתי הצדדים מתחברים. אז לפי הכלי, לפי הכלי יקר בעצם, זה ששני הלוחות 
שבעצם זה ששני הלוחות צמודים אחד לשני חייב להיות קשר בין שני הצדדים. כאשר כל דיברה בצד אחד, יש לה מכנה משותף עם הדיברה שמקבילה לה בצד האחר, ונביא את דבריו. אז הדיברה הראשונה שאנחנו נחבר זה אנוכי השם אל מול לא תרצח. בגלל שאנוכי השם ולכן, לא תר... ולכן אל תרצח, אדם נברא בדמותו של הקדוש ברוך הוא, שנאמר, בצלם אלוקים, ברא, בצלם אלוקים ברא את האדם. הרוצח את האדם למעשה פוגע באופן ישיר בכבודו של הקדוש ברוך הוא. הדיברה הבאה, לא יהיה לך אלוהים אחרים אל מול לא תנאף. יהודי שהולך ונכנס לקט שאינה שלו ועושה לו אלוהים אחרים שלא שייך אליו, דומה בדיוק לאחר שהולך ונכנס למשפ... למשפחה שאינה שלו. לא תישא את השם לשווא ולא אל מול לא תגנוב. אדם שמשתמש בשם השם ללא רשות, הרי זו גניבה, כמו שאדם שבעצם גונב מחברו. אז הדיברה הבאה, זכור את יום השבת לקודשו, אל מול לא תענה ברעך עד, שק, עד שקר. מי שמחלל את השבת למעשה מעיד עדות שקר. כאמור שהקדוש ברוך הוא לא ברא את העולם בשישה ימים ובשבת ביום השביעי. דיברה הבאה, כבד את אביך ואת אמך אל מול לא תחמוד. אדם שאינו מחבר... מכבד את הוריו, זה מכיוון שהוא ראה את ההורים האחרים וחושב שהם טובים משלו. במילים אחרות, אדם שחומד את של אחרים, הרי שלא יכבד גם את הוריו. אז הדיברות בעצם מחוברות אחת לשנייה, ולמרות שהן נראות כל כך שונות, רואים שהן ספציפית היו בסדר הזה, וגם בשתי הצדדים בנפרד, וגם התחברו אחת עם השנייה. Outstanding, just for those who didn't, uh, um, maybe couldn't understand the Ivrit, so I just wanted, um, Ori was talking about how the right side and the left side of the Luchot, how each, like one to six, two, you know, two to seven, you know, how they, they seem so far apart from each other, but actually they complement each other and they actually work together. And when you send it out to me, I'll try to do a translation as well, because this was just, It was so um, thoughtful to think about the ways in which they actually um, really are almost like mirror images of each other, you know, like they, they work together in tandem. For example, she said, you know, God created, you know, Hashem is the one who took us out of Mitzrayim, Hashem is the ultimate God, and then you should respect another person, don't kill another person, um, and, and those kind of work in tandem, and that's, uh, that's a beautiful Beautiful piece, and I sh I'm sure those people who couldn't understand the Hebrew, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure they understand what you said and, and what your sister Leah said as well, because those are beautiful words of Torah. Thank you very much for sharing it with us um, and sharing it in Ivrit, because we need that here. So we appreciate that you did that. Yashakayach um, to you, and um, we'll, we'll see you on Sunday for the Gilat Root, so I can't wait for that too. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Ori. Okay, Yashakayach to you. Yashakayach, wait. Oh, next time. Thank you so much. We now turn to um, our next um, scholar, um, and that will be Moshe Sofer Herlek, who I just have to find. I think he is. Ah, I think I see you. Um, Moshe, can you um, turn your video on? I'm not sure if I can get that. From... Try... Ah, there you are, Moshe. Okay. Um, so Moshe, um, Another silver lining, Moshe was supposed to be in Israel right now and he's spending his year in Israel. Um, he was in Oraita, um, learning incredibly well, um, enjoying his time there. And, um, and we love seeing him, but we know that that's like a bittersweet thing for you. Um, but thank you for bringing some of your Torah from Medinat Yisrael to us, um, because I know you have some wonderful things um, to share with us. Um, some of the incredible wisdom that you developed this year um, in your year in Israel. Nishakai um, to you for being on here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rishki Hillel Naiman, for those lovely words. Uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to discuss uh, this evening the idea that Shavuot um, is far less known, at least in the secular world, than uh, most other Jewish Chagim, despite its importance to uh, our people's history. And in addition to this, people, the Jews who do tend to celebrate Shavuot, they don't tend to love it as much as other Chagim, um, especially Chagim like Hanukkah and Pesach, 
which are rec recognized at the secular level. Um, yet there is an argument to be made that neither of those chagim are truly as important as Shavuot. So the question is why? One opinion I read is that Shavuot is very much associated with learning Torah. Yet most Jews have somewhat of a distant feeling when it comes to learning Torah and often have barely experienced what learning Torah in the right environment really feels like and how much of a positive effect it can have. Another idea I heard was that aside from the all-night Torah study, which, as I just stated, isn't always the most effective form of connection, and the overwhelming amount of dairy food, which isn't easy on lactose intolerant people such as myself, there isn't such a communal um, activity or festive event that's associated with Shavuot as there is with the Pesach Seder or lighting the candles on Hanukkah. But the real reason that I think that Shavuot doesn't get the recognition it deserves is because of the overarching theme that belongs to the Chag, which is, after all, accepting the yoke of Hashem and all of the commandments that come with it. With Chagim like Pesach and Hanukkah, the association is with freedom and rebellion and breaking the shackles of slavery. However, on Shavuot, we're reminded just the opposite. We are still servants of Hashem and must abide by his rules and restrictions. Many people view this as a bad thing, but I think the, the Chag of Shavuot and its association have never been more relevant and important. Quarantine has given us all a chance to appreciate the value of regular routine and what the lack of that can do to someone. Not having a schedule to follow every day is not only physically unhealthy, but mentally straining as well. Without Hashem guiding us on our journey with Halachot and Chukim, we would be lost and unhealthy as a people. Therefore, this year on Shavuot, let's all appreciate the wisdom and guidance of Torah and the mitzvot more than ever. Thank you. Wow, outstanding, Moshe. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, and that gave us a great deal of chizuk. So I appreciate We need that during this time. So thank you so much, Moshe. Really, Yishkayach. Um, now... Boom, we're going to Raina Pirellis. Um, again, some of these people who are far away, not so far away, Raina hails from, uh, from Teaneck, New Jersey. She is a, she is a 10th grader um, at SAR High School. Um, I was Zoha to also be able to learn with Raina for three years. It was just, it's, that was a real privilege that I, uh, I do not take for granted. Um, and uh, we all had an opportunity, a lot of us had an opportunity to hear your mom last night, um, Dr. Tammy Jacobowitz, who spoke so beautifully last night. And your dad um, is also a professor who's very, um, very beloved at YU. Um, but, I, but there's something really sophisticated about Raina in her own right, um, which really makes me feel that it's, um, it's, it's really going to um, enrich our, our thinking. You always do. You always bring in some idea that none of us have ever thought about. And I always um, look forward to your questions and your comments and what you can share with us. Um, so thank you for making time to learn with us tonight. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I want to share a quick thought um, about Shavuot. So if you look at the Psukim that describe Harsinai, um, we can understand um, something really interesting. So in Sefer Shmot, Perak Yod, Pasuk Aleph, we read, Bachodesh HaShlishi, let's say, Bnei Yisrael, Meres Yisraim, Bayom Hazeh, Ba'u Midbar Sinai. Translation is that on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone forth to the land of Egypt, on this day, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. So here's our question. Shouldn't it have said on that day? Why does the Torah orient us to this day, by Yom Hazeh. So in the Sabbath by Rabbi Heschel, he gives a beautiful answer to this question. He writes, this can only mean that the day of giving the Torah can never become past. That day is this day every day. And he continues, the Torah, whenever we study it, must be to us as if it were given today. So this really stuck to me. And I wanna continue and offer one other thought. So each time that it rains, fish actually jump out of the water to greet the falling raindrop. And this seems absurd as they are completely surrounded by water every single day. Though this is by no means a biological explanation of this phenomenon, I heard an application of it that stuck with me from one of the singers last night. He said that we are like these fish. Every day we are surrounded by Torah. The world oozes with Torah and it breathes Torah. But when there is an opportunity to learn more Torah, we don't let it pass by. 
we jump up, we dance in the rain. And this year, without a community to share the gift of Torah with, it's going to feel daunting to enter two days consecrated for Torah study. But if we approach it with a sense of joy, of dancing, the holiday will be elevated. Joy is a personal matter, and Torah learning fosters joy. Hope this can help everyone um, orient ourselves towards Shavuot. It certainly will. Thank you so much. And this was written up. I saw that Raina sent this to me. Uh, so I'm going to send this out as well so that people can really just remember that over the Chag. I think that will be a very important affirmation um, and a sense of how privileged we are to have the Torah and how we can um, go out to greet it in such a, in such a energized and excited way. So thank you so much, Rina. That was beautiful. Yes, Shakayach. Shakayach. Beautiful. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Ilan Hirsch. Um, Ilan is a college student <laughs> at home now, or maybe not, maybe in your apartment, I'm not sure. Um, at Farouk, where are you? <laughs> I'm in Riverdale. You're in Riverdale. Um, Ilan is um, um, not only a great, um, an incredible college student at Baruch, but um, he's, He's a real budding Talmud Chacham, and it's an honor um, to call him my nephew um, because I love him very much. But I also, I think um, his his commitment to be Kovei Itim La Torah, um, even amidst like all the work that you have to do every day and how you're constantly working, um, and you keep your year, Shana of Israel with you always, and you keep on growing in your learning. Um, is something that I admire, um, which is something very hard for people to do um, as they go through go through life. So you role model for me and so many. Um, so thank you for being here. And thank you for waiting to be the last <laughs> speaker for us this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, that beautiful intro. It's very, uh, very special. I appreciate it. And thank you for the, the opportunity to, uh, to learn some talk with everyone for, uh, for these few minutes. So this whole right, this whole uh, this whole beautiful event that was set up, it's uh, for Shavuos, which is yet you know uh, later this week. And Shavuos, we accept uh, you know as people stated before the uh, the giving of the Torah, and we all know that there are five books in the Torah. But what if I told you that there actually aren't five books in the Torah? Rather, there are seven books in the Torah. You probably think that I'm crazy and tell me you know go back to you know to go back to to kindergarten and learn a basic uh, and simple fact in Judaism. But it's actually not so pushy. It's not so simple. So Rashi comments in the, the first, uh, first pasuk in the ninth parak of Mishlei. And, this, and the first pasuk states that there are seven pillars of wisdom. And so Rashi comments on this. Shivat Yimei Vreshit. Right? This corresponds to the seven days of creation. But more importantly, Devar Acher. Shivat Sufrim Shiesh Torah. The seven books in the Torah. Vahibin So Aron. Sefer Asma Masechet Shabbat. So Rashi's second comment says that the seven pillars of faith refer to the seven books that, uh, comp that comprise the Torah. So where are these two extra books uh, coming from? You know, we, we all, uh, we, we thought that there were, there were five. So Rashi was referring to two psukim in Parshad Balotecha, that's uh, in Bamidbar in the 10th parak that reads as follows. So, more importantly than the actual context of these psukim is what surrounds them. So if you, if you at some point later tonight or the next couple of days, you look at uh, these psukim, there are these upside down and inverted, and inverted uh, nuns that uh, are right before Vahib and Zohar and right after. And so, and the other part that Rashi references to is the Gemara and Masech Shabbos uh, 115b to 116a that records the debate about these, what these nuns are doing here. And so uh, one of the opinions, according to, to Rebbe, uh, Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Hiranasi, he says, Rather, the signs that are, that, are, that are there, because there's a portion, there are a portion is considered a book unto itself. And this opinion is also found in Breshis Rabba 64.8. Okay, so now that we've established that it's a legitimate position that there are seven books in the Torah, why is there an 85-lettered Sefer that breaks up Sefer Bamidbar into three separate books. 
So the Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, has a beautiful Torah on this. So the Rav explains that, the Rav, the Rav explains that after many delays between uh, the exodus of Egypt, you know, leaving Egypt, until this point, the Jewish people, until this point in, uh, uh, in Parsh Balotra, the Jewish people are, are finally able to go to Eretz Yisrael. Finally, the promise to Abraham is about to be fulfilled. B'nai Israel are on their final triumphant march. It's a very, very exciting event. Everyone's pumped. Great things are about to happen. However, as the Rav explains, these inverted nuns symbolize the backward story that followed these, these, two, these two psukim. They symbolize a, a sudden stop in the narrative. So the, the Sefer begins with Moshe saying, Arise, Hashem, may your enemies be scattered and may those who hate you flee from you. So the journey to Eretz Yisrael was supposed to be rel relatively simple and easy. However, after these verses, the trajectory of Jewish history is, is changed forever. And the, the Rav explains that this Sefer was supposed to be filled with all of the Jewish people's accomplishments and their amazing journey to Eretz Yisrael. But right after the Sefer, mere 85 uh, letters, the Jewish people begin to complain. This complaint, the, and the complaint is, Vayhi ha'am kimot onanim, so this complaint by Ben Israel about this is the complaint of Ben Israel about the man that marks the beginning of a terrible spiral of just tragic events one after another ranging from Miriam, Miriam speaking Lashon Hara the Lashon Hara of the spies about Eretz Israel the rebellion of Korach and many more tragic events and I think this uh, this story is similar to what we're experiencing now. So if you look at what happened with coronavirus, things began to change, I would say, at least in our, in our daily lives, for most of us, as we're finishing up Sefer Shemot and starting Sefer Vayikra. And so Sefer Vayikra is mostly about mitzvot, uh, korbanot, and the Mishkan, but there aren't that many stories that are taking place in Vayikra. And after the building of the Mishkan, B'nai Israel take a more passive role uh, by listening and learning about the Torah and, and the will of Hashem. And this, this time in quarantine has certainly felt like a Vayikra period. Uh, most of us are home for the majority of the day. We, you know, we aren't, we aren't participating in that many activities outside or with other people. But however, Baruch Hashem, the number of, you know, new coronavirus cases has been decreasing and many restrictions are being lifted. Some shuls are beginning to open up. Some, you know, the same thing's happening at Israel, just at a much uh, faster rate. And so I think this marks the beginning uh, of Sefer Bamidbar. And so whether or not we've taken full advantage of the extra time that we've had during uh, quarantine by either doing more chesed, uh, maybe picking up some learning, working on our familiar relationships, uh, or anything else, or maybe we wish we, we spent the time better, um, we can't make the same mistake that B'nai Israel made and miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime. We should take this time and use it to propel us forward and continue the good habits we've developed over this time, or try to implement new habits with a new perspective on life that we all have. And this way, we'll be able, we will be able to fill the safer of Vahib and Zoharon with all of our accomplishments and achieved goals. With Hashem's help, we will experience the Gula Shlema, and all the Jewish people will march to Eretz Yisrael like our original plan to do so, thus fulfilling our purpose and destiny. Uh, everyone should have an amazing Shavuos, and thank you again for the opportunity to share this Torah. Shakayach, Yishakayach, Ilan. Thank you so much. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful evening. Um, I, I want to just thank everyone who participated this night. Um, once again, I, I also want to thank parents who actually, when I didn't have emails, made sure um, to connect me with, uh, um, with, their, with their children so that I could make sure to give them um, the message where exactly this, uh, this uh, event would take place. Uh, I want to thank Davi Frank, Dita Nyman, um, Leah Stern, Judy Federbush, Judith Vopatten, Ari Stern, Moshe Sofer Herlich, Reina Perellis, and Ilan Hirsch. Tomorrow night, we're going to be having Nachman Mazarik, um, Paul Franks, and Yonatan Nyman Licht give Shirim. Um, but I do want to say um, what a, I, I, some of these students actually were products of SAR, was asked to say that SAR is actually, you know, having their um, B for SAR. Normally, at, normally at the Kahila, we would do like a, um, a, a special um, appeal for SAR. So if you're thinking of, you know, where you want to assist Torah, like you could assist at SAR or any other institution you felt can, you feel can help enhance 
um, people's Torah and their learning. Um, but, but again, um, I really just want to offer my Akarasato for all those people who put in the time to share um, words of Torah um, in, during this Shoshet Mehagbala, um, really allowing us to, to gain strength um, as we um, recommit ourselves to Torah. This will be on um, these, whoever gives me source material, I'm going to put that on. I already have from last night's shirim on, and the recording of the shirim, if people would like to listen to it again, or you want to share it with people you love, um, and you want them to learn a little bit of Torah as well, that will be available for you. Um, I want to wish everyone a wonderful night. Please stay safe, and uh, keep learning, keep learning. Um, amazing time. Thank you so much, everyone. Lila Tov. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Hi, Yoni. Oh, Yoni. Where's Yoni? Hi, Yoni. That was wonderful. It's good to see you. <laughs> a wonderful yeah, learning experience. Everybody. everybody. It was just a wonderful evening. Thank wonderful. you, Gina. Judy. Thank you, Roshki Lenaiman. It was a beautiful evening. Thank you. I have to say ditto. Hi, Dina. <laughs> I got to hear a little bit of Elon. Hi, Ruth and Dorothy. Hi, Ellen. Oh, hi. Have it uh, recorded. Uh, this was definitely an evening to remember.